event from the Sun Institute. Today we will be welcoming uh, Governor Gary Locke. Governor Gary Locke has been the governor of the state of Washington and the Secretary of Commerce of the United States and also the United States Ambassador to the Republic of China. Governor, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. Uh, welcome everyone to our, our second uh, Sign Institute of Policy and Politics uh, that I'll be leading over the uh, next uh, several uh, months. Uh, and I, we have some great uh, speakers with us today. I'll introduce them a little bit uh, more um, intimately and in detail in just a few minutes. Uh, but today's topic is really dealing with the impact of uh, global trade and globalization on our, on our local economies. And we have two great speakers, as I've indicated. Also want to acknowledge the great work of our, um, uh, our fellow a student fellow, student associate, Eduardo uh, Castellet. Uh, he's a sophomore at the International uh, Relations and Econ I'm majoring in International Relations and Economics, and he hails from Barcelona. So welcome. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for really helping put together uh, uh, and organize a great program today. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments. Last week, we were talking about U.S.-China relations, and I was talking a little bit about the dramatic transformation of China's society in the last almost 50 years. I, when Nixon first went to China, nobody could have ever predicted the most radical, um, uh, dramatic transformation, economic and social transformation the world has ever seen. Uh, not only is China now uh, uh, the, the site of so many of uh, the tallest skyscrapers, six, 16, 17,000 miles of high speed rail where trains are going over 200 miles an hour. That's, they've built that in the last 10 years, 16, 17,000 miles. That's more than enough to crisscross America six times, and yet we really have no high-speed rail in America. When Nixon first went to China, our, two, our yearly two-way trade was less than $100 million per year. Investment in each other's uh, markets and economies was close to zero. Only a handful of American jobs relied on trade with China. But today, roughly $1.5 billion of goods and services flow between our two countries every single day. China is America's largest export destination outside of North America, with exports to China until recently uh, growing twice the rate of exports uh, to other countries. And when I was at the Commerce Department, we had this model. The more that American companies export, the more they produce. The more they produce, the more workers they need, and that means jobs for the American people. So exports of American goods and services is very, very important to our quality of life. America is China's largest export destination. In fact, exports from China to the United States surpass the amount of exports from China to all of the EU countries combined. More than 700,000 American jobs depend on producing goods and services exported to China, and several million jobs in China depend, um, well, actually more than, uh, more than uh, two and a half million uh, jobs depend on two-way trade, uh, well, excuse me, 
More than two and a half million jobs in the United States depend on two-way trade with China, both imports uh, and exports. Um, and with the success that they have achieved, a lot of Chinese companies have been going global, investing abroad, establishing factories and offices here in the United States. Um, and the investments in the United States run the gamut from high tech, shale gas, manufacturing, entertainment, food processing, and real estate. And Chinese companies in the United States employ over 200,000 Americans. So measured against the past, our two sides have made enormous progress and people on both sides of the Pacific are benefiting from this deepening economic integration. Uh, there are some downsides, however, to trade um, and uh, we have to wonder just how it has impacted individual communities and how has it benefited individual communities. And to have us talk about that are our two guest speakers, um, uh, Fred Hochberg, a good friend of mine. He's the former chair and, and president of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. He served uh, that role, the longest serving person in that role uh, in the Obama, it, during, during the Obama administration. And before that, he's got a, just a great uh, resume. Uh, during the Clinton administration, he was the acting administrator of the Small Business Association. Uh, and he's written a fantastic book and we'll hear more about it, uh, but is uh, uh, trade, is not a four letter words. Fantastic book, very easy to read and very, very engaging. Uh, he's also um, uh, served as the Dean of the Milano School of International Affairs and Management and Urban Policy at the New York, uh, at the New School in New York City. And he's also been a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government's Institute of Politics, as well as David uh, Axelrod's Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. Uh, before he got into government, uh, he ran the family business where he helped uh, increase uh, revenues, income of the company by a magnitude of 40. And this is a company actually started by his mother. And he talks a, a, a bit about the, how his mother formed really one of the first catalog um, uh, businesses, uh, uh, catalog mail order uh, businesses uh, for uh, women, primarily for women right after World War II. So, um, uh, we're really delighted to have Fred Hochberg with us. Our other guest speaker is Brian Connors, who's the executive director at the Michigan China Innovation Center, which really helps um, Michigan's local and state government coordinate uh, delegations going back and forth, but also attracting job creating investments from China uh, into Michigan. We hear a lot about the impacts of trade on the auto industry uh, in Detroit. Uh, and, um, and how manufacturing has really uh, declined throughout the United States. What has really happened? Has it really just fled to other countries? Uh, have new companies come in to replace them in America? And uh, certainly Brian, uh, with his uh, knowledge, uh, is gonna be, uh, gonna be really giving us some insights into that. He's actually, uh, he's a graduate of Williams College with a degree in Chinese. He'd actually studied in China at the Hopkins Nanjing Center uh, but he also has a master's degree in policy from the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. So with that, uh, let's uh, welcome our guests, Fred Hochberg and Brian Connors. So if we could uh, have them uh, join us. There we go. So with that, um, I'll, let's turn it over to, to Fred for just some opening comments about his uh, observations about trade and, and uh, what has the impact uh, been on our, uh, on, on our economies, Fred? Well, um, uh, thank you. Uh, and as I said, uh, when I was thinking about today, I, I have to go through Secretary Locke, Governor Locke, Ambassador Locke, but most importantly, friend Gary Locke. So uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, trade has been, uh, and as you generously mentioned, I did write a book called Trade is Not a Full Letter Word, primarily to get students, such as those who are joining us today, to sort of get their heads around trade and how it might have an impact. Um, we have benefited enormously, you know, until uh, 2002, not that long ago, just under 20 years ago, we were the largest exporter of goods and services in the entire world. Uh, we were overtaken by Germany in 2002. Um, mm -hmm. And then China overtook Germany. We fell to number three. We're now back in second place. Um, and I think part of what uh, we often forget is how much um, we actually export as a country. We're still the second largest export of goods in the world. And when you add in services, which includes a lot of entertainment, 
financial services and commodities um, in many ways we're the largest export in the world but if you look at goods alone uh, China right now holds the number one uh, slot in that in that regard. But as you mentioned, Gary, it's created a lot of jobs in our country. And uh, since Brian is here, you know, one of the chapters I do I talk about in the book is the auto industry. You know, it it created enormous competition um, and was disruptive, I think, to the auto industry. But I think at the end of the day, um, we have a more vibrant and a more sustainable auto industry as a result of trade and foreign competition. This frankly made our cars better. They now run 100,000 miles or more um, and it can compete globally where they were not that competitive uh, before trade. Brian, uh, some opening comments from you? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much, uh, Governor Locke. And uh, thanks, Fred, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I appreciate the chance to offer my perspective too, I think, which will be more of a local on the ground perspective on this global to local uh, economic ties that we're talking. Coming from my work at the state level in Michigan, um, I wanted to mention uh, a couple of the impacts uh, that exports and FDI have on our state economy respectively and offer a couple of observations. FDI, uh, what's FDI? Oh, thank you. Uh, foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment. So international companies coming in, plopping down a, a warehouse, a, a manufacturing center, a sales office and directly hiring uh, local uh, uh, talent in, in the U.S. So, uh, you know, first, something about what, what I do, um, you know, today, day to day. Uh, so every single state, I, I don't know where all the, the uh, observers uh, are today, but every single state and the city of D.C. has a department or an organization doing something called economic development. And people working in economic development are tasked with increasing the, dynas, the dynamism of their local economies, uh, marketing their regions, investing in talent, accelerating uh, job creation. A gamut of different programs uh, fall into this umbrella of economic development. And among those are programs to promote exports by US companies to foreign markets, and also programs to attract uh, job creating foreign direct investments or FDI into the states. Uh, you know, my team, for example, at, at the state of Michigan focuses on developing business with China and Taiwan in particular. Uh, so I have great stories on the unique considerations of dealing with China and Taiwan. But uh, to get back to exports and foreign direct investment overall, uh, you know, what do you suppose that picture looks like in Michigan? Uh, so take exports. You know, Michigan has been the sixth or seventh largest exporting state year to year. Uh, with the Detroit three automakers there and tons of manufacturers in the automotive supply chain, you can imagine uh, Michigan's biggest export items are transportation equipment, uh, chemicals, you know, we've got Dow in the state of Michigan, as well as Amway, uh, equipment is our third one. Um, Canada is our biggest trading partner in Michigan, followed by Mexico and China, as uh, Governor Locke mentioned. By total trade volume, huge Michigan companies like your GMs and your Dows and others comprise the lion's share of those exports. But if you do look at, at the 15,000 or so companies in Michigan that are exporting, 90% of those exporters are small and medium-sized companies. So what, you know, what is the overall impact of this on the state's economy? I, I would love to hear Fred's take on this. We have used a, a, a calculation that roughly uh, draws an equivalence between about $200,000 in export sales, roughly, um, are equivalent to one uh, kind of full-time equivalent job uh, in the United States. So by that math, uh, exports sustain roughly 5% of Michigan's employment. And to give an example of, of what this looks like, I've got a neat story. There's a company called Ready Rock, a small company in northern Michigan. Uh, they make uh, heavy cement uh, they, may, they do make heavy cement blocks that are used to build retaining walls, kind of on shorelines. Um, but these blocks cannot be exported, right? They're, they're too heavy to be cost effectively uh, exported. So uh, the, the company developed equipment that would allow other players in other countries to produce these uh, very useful blocks. And they quickly grew from zero dollars in exports a year to $3.5 million in exports a year, mainly selling to European markets. Um, our team at the state of Michigan actually helped them uh, with that. And new sales like these, as the governor said, they do result in those companies increasing their headcounts locally. 
So you know, generally we can point to, hey, you know, company increase those, they're, the sales, they're gonna need to add another shift uh, back home, or they're gonna need to hire up another couple of people to fill those orders. Um, so, you know, at that same kind of equivalence uh, of $200,000 a job, that's roughly 15 or 16 new hires that a company like that needs to make. Now, jumping over to, you know, FDI, big picture, FDI is as old as America. It's actually older than America. Uh, and which country do you suppose started FDI in the United States? Well, it's the UK. Um, to this day, the UK comprises the greatest share of the existing stock of FDI in the US, and it's going to take some time, maybe another couple of centuries for other uh, national entrants uh, in the market like Germany or Japan to overcome that lead. In Michigan, uh, Germany and the UK and the Netherlands are the three greatest cumulative sources of foreign direct investment into our economy. Uh, but you see newer countries, uh, well, I shouldn't say newer countries, but uh, newer entrants uh, like Japan, Korea, and China um, are gaining quickly as their um, uh, FDI is increasing at a higher rate year to year. We estimate in, uh, in Michigan, FDI supports about 6% of the jobs in the state of Michigan supported by FDI. So what you're saying is, uh, what you're saying, Brian, are, are these are foreign companies that have established operations in America, in 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 Michigan, hiring people from Michigan to run the to run the business. Correct. Yeah, wow. correct. And, and so when you know when you look at this trend, and people take it for granted that there are all these great foreign companies in the United States, and we have a long history of of being a leader and attracting FDI from all over the world. But uh, you know we shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, in, in a phenomenon that, that turned some heads, China was actually uh, the, the greatest uh, attractor of foreign direct investment in the world in 2020. Um, some say that's a bit of a blip because China was able to recover more quickly uh, from the pandemic due to its very aggressive uh, response on that, where the U.S.'s response, of course, has been somewhat prolonged and the impact's heavy. So I think economists are predicting that U.S. will get back into the top spot at, at uh, attracting FDI for 2021, um, but it's gonna be neck and neck uh, between China and, uh, and uh, the US on that for uh, a number of years. So let me ask you, you know, when, when a Chinese company says, oh, we're gonna establish an operation, we're gonna open up a business, or we're gonna buy an existing, uh, you know, troubled, floundering, failing a business in, in Michigan, were people afraid that, oh my gosh, uh, those Chinese, they're gonna come and buy that factory and they're gonna, empty out all the equipment and ship it back over to China. And, and you know, it's going to result in, in a decrease in jobs in, in Michigan. Do you have any, you know, do you have any, you know, what's, what's the truth there? Did you have any Chinese companies that actually grew and expanded or rescued American companies and hired a lot of local people? Yeah, it, people do raise those questions. Um, I think people raise those questions anytime there's an acquisition, even if it's a U.S. company acquiring another uh, U.S. company. Um, but the track record in Michigan has been pretty good in this regard. Um, one really gl gleaming example is that of Next Year, uh, which was once known as Saginaw Steering Gear. It's a company that makes, uh, it, it makes steering systems and steering gears for you know, trucks and vehicles. They were facing bankruptcy. They were at one time a GM company were facing bankruptcy. And uh, eventually a, a company that was funded out of China uh, came in uh, acquired the company lock, stock and barrel, and they grew it. Uh, they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars more in Michigan uh, and increased uh, the headcount there by a number of thousands of jobs in the United States, in Michigan alone. It's a very interesting example, um, Governor Locke, because the, the company that acquired them is a state-owned company back in China. So that, that comes with certain red flags and sensitivities. And the, the entity that they acquired in Michigan is a UAW facility. It's a unionized facility. So very interesting, kind of a, you could say a clash of cultures in there. Um, but somehow that has resulted in uh, prosperity for the company and a big positive impact uh, on the region where they're headquartered in Saginaw, kind of up in northeastern Michigan. Fred, you know, in, in your book you talk a lot about, for instance, I'd love the the section talking about avocados and how. Um, you know, so many of the things that we grow in America are, are seasonal. And if we want some of this stuff year round, we're going to have to import it in from other countries. Can you tell us a little bit about avocados and, and how that trade of avocados has actually benefited consumers uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, while, while protecting our agricultural economy? 
Well, uh, sure, thank you. And you know, uh, Gary, I was up in um, New England uh, the summer before I was writing the book and I was at a breakfast and there was a bowl and it said seasonal fruits and it just struck me and I thought, seasonal, what are they talking about? We don't grow melons in Nantucket or in <laughs> Massachusetts. We don't grow um, uh, bananas. And uh, so that's how that sort of idea sifted in. And uh, yes, we really hardly ate any avocados in this country pre-NAFTA. NAFTA really opened that up. For a while, um, we produced, and then initially we produced enough avocados to meet our needs. And uh, now, oddly, we consume over four and a quarter billion pounds of avocados a year. Um, a few weeks ago on Super Bowl Sunday, we smashed 140 million avocados into guacamole. Um, and um, this has changed both our diets and also it's actually helped a number of American producers. One of the things I talk about in the book is blueberries. You know, for, a, for many years, we could enjoy blueberries basically in July and August. They came from largely in New Jersey and Maine were the places that you would get blueberries. Well, now we import them. Uh, a lot of them come from Chile and Mexico. Uh, so we can enjoy them 12 months a year. But what also happened, we now consume double the amount of blueberries that we did beforehand. So we took something that was rare, something we didn't really enjoy very much, both as consumers and also for the growers, and in the end created a far bigger market for that. So one of the things, you know, um, elected officials in particular never like to talk about imports. They like to talk about exports because as, as you mentioned, exports are about jobs. Well, imports, one, increase the quality of our life. Imports, and China is a major source of this. Uh, you have firsthand experience because a lot of the inputs that go into automobiles. A lot of the technology that is incorporated into machinery is imported. So we have, and one thing this COVID crisis has also created is an understanding about what a global supply chain was. When I wrote the book, and going back to your question about the avocado, people didn't really understand what a supply chain was or where things came from. Um, this crisis has made us much more aware of one, our interdependence on the rest of the world. And, and frankly, we're not gonna solve this COVID crisis on our own. Uh, and we're not gonna solve climate change on our own. So um, perhaps a trade and perhaps the crisis, the pandemic we are work, we're, we're working our way through right now has kind of made us remember again, we're far more independent on it, interdependent on each other. Um, we're gonna to have to figure out how to make that work. And it's not always gonna work perfectly, but um, there isn't really a very good alternative to that. Great. Particularly well, if you like avocado toast. <laughs> uh, uh, I think your statistic in the book, I had to, I had to flag it, was that uh, prior to all this trade, like you say, NAFTA, uh, American, uh, United States was the second largest avocado producer in the world, uh, growing on average of about 150, 50,000 tons per year. And then after that, um, let's see, we now, uh, we now consume 4 billion, uh, well, I can't remember the statistic here, yeah, but four it, a quarter billion. It's, it's now grown, the consumption of avocados in America has grown four times, right? multiplied four times. And we're still, we're still growing avocados uh, but we're now supplying uh, our, our appetite for avocados and guacamole year round, uh, thanks to imports. Uh, Eduardo has some questions for us. It's actually gonna involve the audience and, and all those uh, participating. So Eduardo, why don't you give us our first question that we're gonna ask everybody to, uh, uh, to weigh in on. Of course, Governor. The first question for the audience and the poll will come up soon is, was the trade war with was the trade war between the United States and China that happened this year net positive for the United States? Answer as you want, and then the panelists will give out their opinions. Okay. All right. So everybody go onto your computers and was the trade war with China net positive for the United States? Yes, no, I don't know. All right, I'm filling in my answer. 
and hit submit and uh, all right okay here are the results we'll give everybody just a few more seconds all right and it says 19 percent said yes it was a net positive for america 58 percent said no 23 percent said i don't know all right um let's uh Fred, you agree with that? Uh, what, what's your view on the trade war? I mean, don't we, but don't we have big concerns about China's trade and economic policies? Right, and that, the, the challenging part, and it's a good question because um, the problem with trade wars is once you start them, they're really hard to stop them. They tend to escalate. We, we put a tariff on China, they put a tariff on our goods. We put another tariff on their goods, they put another tariff on our goods, as we've had with the steel and aluminum tariffs. Um, one thing, I do believe President Trump did get right. And I actually, it's one of the, I put it in the book. I think he called a question on China. I think that he has pulled the curtain back. And I think we tried in many ways over the last 20, 30 years to find ways to accommodate China, find ways through them joining the World Trade Organization, through our normalizing trade relations with them around the year 2000. Um, and I think we had different hopes that they would adopt more um, Western ways of operating their economy and engaging with the rest of the world. That has proven to be false. So I'm not sure, I don't believe a trade war was the way to do it, but I think it was right to say we've got to really do a reset and the world needs to do a reset with China. And one of the things I would add is China is very much interested in selling, as you mentioned, Gary, we're the largest destination for the goods. They want to sell to the entire world. And if possible, they'd like to buy as little as possible from the rest of the world. That's not really how we see it in the United States. That's not how the EU sees it. We see, a, you know, if we want someone to buy our goods, we also have to be a good customer. Um, and the idea that, and frankly, I think President Trump tried to do this, we should sell to everybody and buy from nobody. That doesn't really work. That is China's view. And I think, but it is important that, and we're going to have a challenging time, not just in the United States, but the rest of the world. How do we reset this with China so that it's more level playing field? My understanding is that uh, from the trade war, we've actually, America has actually lost some 245,000 jobs because of the trade war. Right. And that's according to some business groups. I mean, as you indicated, Fred, we put a tariff on all goods coming from China and that affected shoes, clothes, sporting goods, um, you know, electronic items and even components that American companies use when they manufacture something. So it, the tariff was not a tax paid for by China. It's paid for by the company that brings the stuff into America you pay it at the docks, basically. Right. And that's passed on to the consumer, whether you're buying, you know, that that little item at Costco or Target or Walmart or Nordstrom. And it, and as it makes our exports more expensive because right. as those components go into products, we want to then export airplanes, automobiles, and so forth. Those become more costly because a tariff has been levied on them for the components coming into our country. Right. So it's it's more expensive when our American company tries to sell it around the world. China puts a tariff on it if we try to sell it into China, which then makes that American product more expensive in China. And the problem with the trade war is that China did not have to buy stuff made in America. Right. They don't have to buy Boeing airplanes. They can buy Airbus. They don't have to buy GE X-ray or MRI equipment. They can buy German. And they don't have to buy American soybeans. They can buy soybeans from Brazil. Right. But so much of what we consume in America is only made in China or predominantly made in China. So we're stuck with it. And the Wall Street Journal and I think the New York Fed estimated that the impact of the trade war between China and the United States cost the average American household $800 to $1,000 more per year. Right. And what's interesting, though, is that a lot of the other companies around the countries around the world have the same complaints about China's trade and economic policies. They want us to win this trade war. But when American products are more expensive, it means the German product, the Canadian product, the British product 
is actually cheaper. So their companies are getting all the business. American companies are hurting, even though those other countries want us to uh, uh, win the trade war and get China to change its economic policies. Um, Brian, have you seen any impacts of, of this play out in, in Michigan very briefly? We well, yeah, have certainly, uh, you know, there's so many companies, I mean, a lot of, you know, a car, a lot of the cars we manufacture in Michigan actually crossed the border with Canada like six times by the, before we you know, finally shipped them to a dealership. So uh, the automotive supply, supply chain is extremely intertwined in this question. And people got hammered uh, very badly by those tariffs. Uh, a lot of uh, them kind of agreed, you know, with their customers to kind of split the difference for a period of time, but they can only put up with that for so long. So ultimately, we have seen a little bit of what you know Trump actually intended, which, which is that, well, these tariffs are going to be here for a while. Companies are saying, we need to jump over that tariff barrier and actually put more capacity locally. So we've actually seen some companies increasing their presence uh, in Michigan as a result of the need to uh, produce locally here um, in the United States. So a few examples of that, but of course, the broader argument, like you're saying, is and economically, in terms of the size of the overall pie and everything, we, we all lose. Uh, in this picture, it's just a matter of kind of uh, distribution and some of the politics of it. So I thought I thought Fred's take on that was uh, was interesting. The kind of first uh, knee jerk that uh, this raises the question uh, and and really vaults that uh, whole question of national competitiveness and China's practices to the front of uh, the national agenda and even in the international agenda with with Europe. I kind of think that's the most uh, lasting uh, impact as well. Eduardo, next question. Yes, extremely good answers. The second question is: Does the yes. does the United States <laughs> does the United States benefit from the global economy? <laughs> the poll will come up now. Does the United States benefit from the global economy? Yes or no? I don't know. And the answer is, oh my gosh, does the United States benefit from the global economy? 96% say yes, 4% say no. And we don't have any I don't knows. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, well, Fred, uh, is there much to say about that? Uh, it's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, uh, you know, when you poll Americans, uh, they believe we do benefit from the global economy. Um, they believe that uh, greater engagement is to our benefit overall. Um, but, you know, you always have to be a little careful of also surveys. You know, if you ask uh, mem uh, voters, what do they think of, the, of Congress? Uh, it's often a single digit, you know, 9%. What do you think of your member of Congress? Oh. 75%. So uh, we have to be careful about that. But clearly, and uh, Gary, you saw this firsthand in, in, in many aspects of your career, but in terms of trade, in terms of exports, in terms of the quality of life, um, you know, people are clamoring still and will continue to, to move to and immigrate into this country, to emigrate into this country. This is a place people want to live um, and want to raise a family. Um, that is not true in many parts of the world. You know, people are not, frankly, clamoring to move into China um, and, and to many other countries. So we have some unique advantages. We have a lot of challenges right now, and we've seen a lot of them laid bare in 2020, from social justice to the COVID crisis, to our health crisis, to what happened at the Capitol just a month ago. But um, the prospects and the hope for this country are still greater, and that has to do with engaging with the rest of the world. But let me ask you, um, you know, 96% say that uh, America benefits from, from a global economy and from trade. How have, but it's been uneven. There are a lot of communities, a lot of uh, sectors that have been hurt by trade. I mean, um, Brian, you talk about the automotive industry. I mean, certainly we could have more factories in Detroit or, you know, parts of the United States because Toyota and Honda build in other states, not just in, in Michigan. Um, but we've also lost some jobs due to trade. And have we done a good enough job offsetting uh, those uh, detrimental impacts? I mean, I think you talk a little bit about it in your book, uh, uh, Fred. I mean, what, 
what should policymakers be doing given the fact that trade does not benefit everybody or impact everybody equally? Well, I mean, I think we've done it. I think we've done a pretty poor job, to be blunt. Um, you know, President Kennedy first came out with something called trade adjustment assistance, recognizing that there would be people who would bear more of the burden of greater trade with the rest of the world. It's never been fully funded. It's never been fully endorsed and supported. There are some recent studies that when it has been in place, it has um, helped and supported workers make a transition. But frankly, we're on the cusp of such monumental changes in our economy. Uh, and I think the COVID crisis has accelerated that, a move to online shopping, a move to digitization, a move away from retail. Um, the fact that we're having a class like this now versus um, having Brian and I fly into Washington and, and, and the logistics of that. And we need to do a much better job of preparing people preparing a students not you know they think of commencement as a day okay i'm done with education and frankly it should be when you're going to commence the rest of your education because this economy is changing so rapidly um we haven't really put enough effort in to give people the tools so that they can be more adaptable and and more flexible and more resilient as these changes come through you know um, one of the people I talked to when I was writing the book talked about lifelong readiness. You know, when if there's going to be, uh, I know Michigan has some ferocious snowstorms right now. You know, if you're going to have a lot of snow, well, you might get some extra sand and salt to keep in your by the front door. You might make sure you got a shovel. I uh, make sure the car has antifreeze and a full tank of gas. So we have to do that to ourselves. How do we prepare ourselves for what's going to come? And I think we need to. We haven't done a very really good job of that. Brian, uh, what what um, what should have or could have been done to offset some of the uh, disproportionate impacts or the uneven impacts of trade, especially for people who were dislocated or businesses that closed up and moved out, uh, that outsourced or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I'll echo some of some Fred's notions here that it has a lot to do with investing in people. You know, from from the government side, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, trade is ultimately inevitable. Um, technological advancement is inevitable, and uh, you know, a lot of the jobs that have been displaced in places in Michigan were displaced more by automation than they were by free trade and factories moving to uh, to Mexico. Actually, by by a long shot. So, you know, those jobs were going away anyhow. Uh, and yet we do have places in Michigan, which is not at all atypical. There are regions of our state that have been hollowed out in terms of uh, employment, you know, demand for kind of traditional skill sets. So like, the question is, is you know, how, how can the government kind of capture some of the benefits of, of those advancements, uh, the efficiencies of trade, advancements in technology, and redistribute it to uh, communities in ways that will help people uh, improve their long-term competitiveness? So that's the big question, but it seems like it's a tough one. And it seems like politically, there has not been a lot of appetite for, you know, much bigger government that's going to deliver for, you know, for example, free community college or apprenticeship programs or you name it. It's exactly what uh, the doctor ordered. But, uh, uh, you know, grandpa and grandma are not willing to, to, to take the doctor's, uh, doctor's uh, medicine, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's a tough one for America. Yeah. I think um, Brian's right. I think it is tough. And you know, we have, we still have this pioneer spirit. You know, you should quote unquote, lift yourself up by your bootstraps and all that. And that, that is so part of an, I think the American ethos that um, it's hard to shake that, that it is nothing, it is appropriate for a government to provide you those services and help you transition and prepare you for a, a fruitful career that, that provides you and your family with a good living. That's, but we have, we've been fighting that, that idea for a long time and, and we're paying the price for it. Yeah. A third question, Eduardo. Yes, our third and last poll question is, do tariffs benefit local communities? And the poll should come up now. Do tariffs benefit local communities? Yes, no, I don't know. Do 
tariffs benefit local communities? Yes, no, I don't know. All right, and the results of the poll? All right. Uh, do tariffs benefit local communities? 21% say yes. 58% say no. 21% 21 21 say I don't know. All right, great, great results. A little bit more uh, ambivalent there. I think we've actually kind of touched about on this uh, already through our conversation, so I, I don't think we need to to elaborate, but you know, um, Fred, I think you had some maybe some slides or something that you might want to present or want to go over. Well, or? I did, but um, um, I was going to do that at the outset just to get the conversation going. But I somehow feel like the conversation's moving along. So um, <laughs> maybe what we might want to, if you want to, just open it up for student questions. Okay. All um, right. And I, by the way, I hope Frank Dubois may be uh, yes. listening because he, he, he's got a question for you. Oh, good. I he's at AU and uh, he was an, an enormous uh, help and a source uh, on the chapter I wrote about the American automobile. So I'm, uh, I'm glad that Frank's joining us today. You know, actually uh, about the American automobile, I did some research on it and I, uh, I'm glad you kind of raised it, uh, Brian. So much of the job loss that we've had in America has not been due to outsourcing, although some of it. And, and I think both of you have talked about uh, whether or not we have done enough to assist uh, uh, dislocated workers. Alan Mulally, who used to be the head of the Boeing company, then went on to head up the Ford, uh, Ford Motor Company, uh, told me that uh, it now takes 40% fewer workers today compared to 20 years ago to build the same number of automobiles. 40% fewer American workers to build the same 100 or 1,000 automobiles than it did 20 years ago. And the output per automobile worker in Detroit, the efficiency has gone up and the productivity has gone up by 66%. Now one can say, well, that's maybe, you know, part of the, the greater output is because some of the components are, are, you know, coming from other places and suppliers and, you know, all they're doing is, snapping these cars together. But take a look at the forest industry, the timber industry. I think it's about 50% fewer number of people to cut down the same number of logs than it did 20, 30 years ago. Why? Because instead of a, a, a huge crew of people with chainsaws cutting down trees and then bringing in all these specialized equipment to haul the logs out, they now actually have one guy almost like in a caterpillar bulldozer type mech uh, uh, apparatus that grabs the tree by the trunk, cuts th the tree, saws it off at the bottom, and then automatically hauls, then, then hauls the, the log out to the uh, uh, place where they're piling them all up. And it's all done by one person instead of a crew of four or five. Right. You know, and that's not, there's no outsourcing there. You know, it's all because of automation uh, and in some ways, even artificial intelligence. So with that, let's go. Uh, Eduardo, why don't you give us the first question? Yes, from the, the, first, audience. the first question is by Professor Frank Dubois from the Cogat School of Business. Uh, Mr. Dubois says, hi all, Frank Dubois, faculty at the Cogat School here. How do you see the US trade policy with China changing under the Biden administration? Brian, you wanna take a look, take a crack at that? Oh, shoot, I'm probably the least qualified to say, but it, we're also just reading the tea leaves here. Um, early indications suggest that uh, there isn't great appetite in the new administration to roll back um, those tariffs. You know, they, they have them in place. Uh, rolling them back is a, is a pretty compli co complex process, as, as Fred has said. Um, there are also a number of people who have entered the administration. Um, Jake Sullivan, the, the, the new uh, national security um, uh, the, the advisor. NSA, yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the NSA is, is somebody who's more, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, the China, China hawk is maybe simplistic, but uh, there are a number of people who I think favor uh, having a more assertive posture with regard to China who have entered the administration in a number of key posts. Um, so I think they'll be looking, you know, doing their own uh, major assessment of the relationship and looking at the tariff question that within that framework. So I, I don't expect them to go away any, any time soon. That's kind of what we're telling our automotive players. Fred? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, from what I understand, um, 
I don't think the Biden administration, Biden Harris administration, is really looking to do a lot more trade deals. Um, you know, uh, trade deals have proven to be very contentious in our country, very hard to get through Congress. Um, and they don't contribute that much uh, to GDP or employment. They sort of, they do integrate and they're really a lot of, they're a tool of foreign policy. But I think uh, if I had to guess, we're not gonna see a lot of movement in that area right now. And I agree with Brian. I think that um, I don't believe that tariffs uh, have benefited us on the same time they're in place. And I think unwinding them will take some time and care and, um, are part of a negotiation. Mm -hmm. Many people have said that, uh, again, because Americans have singularly been hurt by the tariffs, according to the poll and even according to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Fed about the impact on every average household in America. Many have said that because other countries share the same concerns uh, and objections about China's trade and economic policies, their lack of enforcement of uh, intellectual property, um, forced technology transfer, the fact that <clears throat> so many sectors of the Chinese economy are off limits to foreign investment. I mean, if, if a U.S. company wanted to do more stuff uh, by a company in China, there are many parts where foreign investment is not allowed. Whereas in America, just about anything is allowed. I mean, you have all these French and German and British uh, <clears throat> companies Entering in uh, Nestle, you know Nestle Chocan, you know uh, uh, is is uh, is a European company, and you got all these German companies, uh, brands that we always thought were American are actually foreign brands. We're very open, so some have said that a more effective strategy would be joining up with our other countries around the world with concerns about China and having a united policy, a united course of action against China instead of just the United States and China, because if we impose a tariff on China, China retaliates only against the US. That really France, Germany, the EU and Canada and many other countries, we should all be joining together and having a common course of action so that China cannot retaliate against uh, I mean, they would have to retaliate against the entire world, which would, which would not be to their benefit. Um, Great. So the next I just question. I think that's a lot harder to do today than, yep. it may, than it may appear. And especially since we've imposed America under the Trump administration, imposed tariffs on all of our allies. Right. <laughs> Why would they want to help us? You know? Uh, okay, great. Next question, Eduardo. The next question is asked by Eli Duncan Gummer from Washington, D.C. He's also a sophomore at SIS. And he's asking, when is it ever worth accepting a reduction to the size of the economic pie in order to protect regions whose well-being would be disproportionately impacted by outsourcing? The big question for Michigan. Um, you've seen benefits of global trade in Michigan, but you've also been directly impacted uh, from other sorts of manufacturing and everything else. Uh, Brian? Yeah, I mean, it's that's not so much an economic question as just a political question, it sounds like to me. It's mm -hmm. uh, people are disproportionately impacted and how, uh, you know, imagine a group of 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 or 10 million people, as in the case of Michigan. How do you want to divvy up that pie? Do you, do you want to pay a little bit more, uh, you know, at, 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 the, at the counter at Walmart uh, because, uh, you know, the U.S. has taken a more aggressive uh, posture toward China in order to protect jobs. I mean, the economists will, will say that that's not the best way to do it. I think a better way to do it would be direct transfers into uh, education and training. But as we covered, that, that doesn't seem to often be the first uh, choice that politicians uh, turn to. Fred? Uh, same thing. I think that, you know, we, we've had policies that, that provide support for people to make a transition. What we need to do, though, is you know, we even have an unemployment system today that you get a payment of perhaps six for six months, up to six months generally, uh, for a, a percentage of your salary. That implies if you're in, in Michigan and you get laid off by GM, you can go across town and go work at Ford. Well, generally, if you're getting laid off by GM, Ford's also doing a layoff, as is Chrysler doing a layoff. So, so we really have to rethink our whole support system uh, you know, some have suggested, I, one of the people I researched in the book said, 
maybe we ought to give people a lump sum if they lose their job, regardless of the reason, mm -hmm. give them a lump sum. Therefore, they actually would have some money to perhaps provide some new training or to relocate to another part of the country where, where there are more jobs. But when we dole it out several hundred dollars a week, that may not give them the ability to really make those changes. So I think we really have to look at our economy, look at the dynamics in it, and, and make those adjustments. And I think these issues are going to be even more profound with the impact of AI. Forget about global trade. Forget about import exports. Um, with AI coming, there's going to be a huge disruption to our workforce. And what is the role of, of government what is the role of private sector nonprofits and, and the higher education institution? You know, I've, I've actually always thought that, you know, our, our unemployment insurance system is kind of reactionary. We wait for someone to lose their job before we provide assistance. And like you say, um, Fred, it's only for a fraction of their salary, maybe 40% of their salary, and for only certain so many months. Maybe we ought to be treating unemployment insurance as kind of like a a uh, health insurance flex fund where you can actually draw upon it and get the job training and retraining so that you don't get laid off. You're actually able to move into another job. Right. And um, instead of waiting until you're out of work uh, before you, you, you get benefits, we need to be proactive. Uh, and actually that's gonna be the topic of our next uh, seminar in two weeks about the disruptive impacts of AI to, the, to our economy. The next question then, Eduardo. Of course. The next question is asked by Baba Kafesi, who is a professor at the Kovac School of Business. He asks, what can the U.S. do to maintain its innovation versus China? Fred? Well, I think we touched on some of that. I mean, we, we, need, we so underinvest in uh, infrastructure, in job training, um, in, in, in things that support workers and people for how they can earn a better living. I mean, you know, we have relied, Brian probably knows more about this than any of us, uh, on the gas tax to essentially take care of our highways. Well, um, that hasn't really increased in a meaningful, when it was in, instituted in the late 50s, I think it was about 40% of the cost of a gallon of gas was the tax. It's now less than half of that. Um, and I'm, you know, and I know, uh, thankfully, I'm not in the government right now because if you talk about taxes or gas tax, you know, that's 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 like the third rail. You're not allowed to talk about that. But we have got to start putting the investments in. You know, I I originally lived in New York City. Um, the subways were all, you know, put in over 100 years ago. We added two subway lines: the Second Avenue subway and a subway to the Javits Center uh, and Hudson Yards. But we should be, we need to continually invest in that. It's like owning a home. You cannot own a home and not put money into a new roof, new plumbing, new um, uh, mechanicals on a regular basis. So we aren't doing that to our economy. That's what we need to do if we're going to stay competitive. And we need to do, and frankly, we need to do more basic research that is the kind of things that, that the federal government funds because basic research is where there is not a direct tangible product or commercialization immediately available. The only people who can afford to do that is the government. When Companies are not going to do that kind of basic research. They will be a beneficiary and create greater economic opportunity and greater jobs, but they need to be using that information. So that's, that's what I would say. All right, next question, Eduardo. <clears throat> yes, next question comes from Fernanda Reyes, who's a sophomore at AU SIS. She was wondering, taking into account what Governor Locke mentioned, is it possible to regain trust after the Trump era from our allies, or will it lead to us having to make unnecessary deals with these allies? Uh, I don't know if Fred wants to weigh in on that, uh, being close to um, the US government, federal government, whether Clinton administration, the Obama administration. I think that under a Biden administration, there's definitely gonna be outreach to our allies. Um, you know, we cannot, operate in the world by ourselves. We need the support, the alliance, um, and partnership with many other countries, whether it's on climate change, whether it's finding a cure for cancer, wh whether it's fighting global terrorism or stopping the proliferation of nuclear weapons in North Korea or Iran and elsewhere. We cannot do it alone. And the Trump administration's policies of sticking it uh, to other countries, uh, even our, our 
closest friends made absolutely no sense. That's why they're not willing to help us. That's uh, that's why they've kind of just walked away from us. I think uh, the Biden administration is clearly going to reach out to them and um, and uh, try to repair those relationships and working together in partnership. So, next question. Next question is actually from me. Uh, oh. I must write as I guess. And I was wondering, in the Obama era, the U.S. signed on and created the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Uh, when the Trump administration started, we walked out of that agreement. And now China has joined the agreement that we originally created, having access to a lot, a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, their trade representatives and their trade laws. Do you, do you think that the United States should rejoin the, P, the TPP or stay away from it? Fred. Well, uh, just Eduardo, just a point of clarification. Uh, China did not join the TPP. They created something called RECEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Plan, I believe is what the P stands for. So it is um, sort of an alternative to TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's 15 countries in Asia. Um, that have reduced tariffs and greater flow of goods and services between those 15 countries. Um, so it remains to be seen uh, how that works. Uh, from the people I sp have spoken to, um, members of Congress, uh, people in Washington, it does not feel like the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, is likely that we would be joining that anytime soon. Um, Interestingly, the United Kingdom would like to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And, <clears throat> and partly we're, we're at a place right now in our, in our politics, you know, when NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement was signed in early 90s, actually went into effect January 1st, 1994, there were perhaps a dozen free trade agreements in the world. Uh, today, there are over 600. Um, we have 20. So where 25, 26, 27 years ago, we were at the forefront, um, we've now been largely sidelined. And I think we have to do more about our internal politics. I think we have to find more sense of common purpose. And I know these sound like just vague terms, but passing a trade agreement with a one vote margin and it being such a contentious and taking six years, for example, for the agreement with Korea, Colombia, and Panama to get approved by the House of Representatives. Um, I don't think that's a really a good prescription for us right now. So um, my hunch is we may have to find other ways to engage with trading part. Listen, we, we don't have a, a trade agreement with Vietnam. We can trade with countries. Uh, what a trade agreement does is it helps to find what are the taxes? It helps to find if there's a dispute, how do you resolve disputes between companies or country, two different countries? So it makes for a more stable environment. It makes for more harmonious, but it doesn't prevent us from engaging if we don't have an agreement. Um, but you know, on trade-specific partnership, uh, Donald Trump did pull out of it, but frankly, the Democratic caucus um, and Bernie Sanders had a lot to do with sort of souring the tenor of Democrats on the transfer partnership. So by the time Donald Trump came to office, I would say there was not support on either side of the aisle, um, either Republicans or Democrats for that agreement. But Gary, you, you, were, you were close to that. Yeah, I was very, very close to that. And let me just say that I know our time is running short, so I'll try to be brief. I think it is a mistake for the United States not to be part of the TPP. Uh, because, you know, for a long time, our labor environmental groups um, and uh, representatives of, of workers have complained and even businesses have complained about the unfair treatment of American goods um, when we try to sell to many other countries. Uh, that uh, countries like Vietnam impose a huge tariff or a tax on that American product entering Vietnam. There's not much of a tax on a Vietnamese product coming into the United States. In fact, there, we, America has very low tariffs or taxes on all foreign goods coming into the United States, whether it's from France, Germany, England, or Vietnam, uh, or, or Japan. But those other countries impose large taxes on our products. And we know that our workers, our companies have to abide by high 
environmental, health, and human safety standards. So if the Washington grower of an apple has to abide by all these protections against the use of pesticides, protection of their workers, that's expensive compared to the farmer in Chile growing that apple without those similar protections, which makes American apples much more expensive around the world compared to the Chilean apple or the Chilean apple coming into our grocery stores. The TPP would have addressed those inequities and raised the standards of manufacturing in these other countries if they're going to sell to the United States, lowered the tariffs or the taxes on American goods so that we could sell more. So the TPP was really addressing a lot of the concerns that people had about the unfairness of world trade. And so this would have really presented for the first time what we called a high standards trade agreement. I don't believe in free trade, I believe in fair trade. And China was afraid of the TPP because of the high standards being imposed and that someday their trade agreements with other countries would have to incorporate these high standards. Anyway, as, as Fred indicated, there was very little support in the Congress because people right now are against trade. What's interesting though, is that the revision of the NAFTA agreement called the USMCA, US-Canada-Mexico trade agreement that Donald Trump put together was really just taking all the chapters out of the TPP and slapping it on to the Canadian agreement. As much as he said, TPP was terrible, terrible, terrible. All they did was use TPP language to modify and update the US-Canada-Mexico trade agreement. The same thing with the trade agreement recently negotiated with Japan, or was it Korea? It was just taking chapters of the TPP that the Trump administration so vilified right. and put it on top of that a trade agreement. So anyway, uh, I think it's a mistake, but I agree with Fred. It's going to be uh, tough politically to get uh, any new trade agreement, fair trade agreement passed through the Congress. Uh, Brian, your thoughts on whether or not um, uh, TPP should should be passed? Oh, I, I guess I'm, I'm tempted to pass on that one. You, you've given uh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful comments on Brian, it. Brian, are you running for office? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I think anybody who's smart would notice that none, none, you can't summarize that in a sentence. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's a... Uh, I thought it was a shame when Trump uh, came and, and threw it out uh, because it was uh, understood to be an Obama initiative. And, and yeah, there was a lot of hair on it from both sides of the party, but would have been good for America's national interests, no question. Wish, wish we'd done it. <laughs> Eduardo, any other questions? We're out of questions, unfortunately. Great. All right. Well, actually, we're at the end of the hour, and so I'll, I'll leave it to uh, turn it over to our, our guests for any concluding remarks. Brian, briefly, any concluding remarks? Oh, it's been a, a real pleasure to be a, a part of this. I'm glad that uh, you know, the moderators, the speakers, and of course, the students out there are paying a, a close attention to these uh, issues, you know, big, big topics, uh, trade, uh, innovation, um, technology, um, and all these things. But they, you know, what really matters is what's it doing to your neighbors? Uh, here, well, not the only thing that matters, but certainly matters what's happening to our neighbors here in uh, in American communities. So thanks for being a part of the discussion. Very fun. Fred? Uh, Gary, always a pleasure to, to spend some time with you and uh, get a chance to talk about trade. Um, uh, I learned a, an awful lot from uh, my time in government and from my students, as you mentioned, when I was at the Institute of Politics at both uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard, where Brian went and um, and University of Chicago. And um, so, uh, and if you're curious, it's now in paperback. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for having us. Thank you very much. I was gonna, I, I didn't want you to have to plug your own book. I was gonna plug your book. So uh, right, Fred Hotford, uh, trade is not a four letter word. Really interesting reading and especially the history about your mom creating uh, th that business. Uh, uh, right after World War II to provide uh, almost catalog mail order goods for women uh, that, uh, you know, given all the rationing that occurred during World War II. Um, our next uh, seminar is March 3rd, noon time, East Coast time, DC time. And we're going to be talking about the impact of artificial intelligence on the workforce. It's kind of a, we're, we're moving from US-China relations to global economy, uh, and to now the disruptions that we're going to face within our our own economies due to AI and and um, and um, and other forces. So that's March third at noon. 
so thank you very much uh, for attending and participating to the students. Eduardo, thank you very much for the poll questions. Uh, Fred, always a delight. And Brian, keep up the great work in Michigan, uh, bringing jobs to the people of Michigan. Bye-bye all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.